What's going on, everybody? C4 here, and welcome back to our continued 2019 draft prep. Today, going to be probably one of the more least sexier videos because we're talking about the offensive line. We're going to do tackles and interior offensive line in both top 10s. Not going to be super, super in-depth because obviously there's only so much tape I have watched on offensive linemen. Pretty much, if you're not, you know, my top six, seven, like honorable mentions, like I, I put a lot of work in the honorable mentions for like running backs and wide receivers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, it's offensive linemen. No one really wants to watch that kind of tape. I'm, you know, I'm a busy YouTuber. I have other content to watch. So a lot of these guys that are later, like cusp guys, I, I'm taking the word for, I watch maybe a cut up or two and then people that I trust for their evaluation. Um, but this is usually a very important video for people because offensive line is a spot that not many people want to watch like the highlight reels of. And most teams in the NFL need them. So we're going to start with the tackles, and then we're going to finish up with the interior offensive linemen. I've grouped the offensive guards and centers into a top 10 list. So that being said, jumping into our tackle rankings, 1.0 that we released way, way back. Uh, I only did top five because, again, it's it's just uh, watching offensive line tape is not fun. Uh, except one of these players in this draft class, especially at the tackle spot, had very fun tape. Uh, but for honorable mentions for tackles, I had Max Sharping and Yodney Kajust. And then top five, I had number five, Calvin Throckmorton from Oregon. He went back to school. Four was David Edwards. Three was Dalton Risner. Uh, two was Greg Little. And one was Jonah Williams. So that was the base starting point. Here is our flushed out top ten, uh, obviously going into the scouting combat. Number ten, we have Chuma Edoga. Six foot four, 295 pound tackle from USC in 2018. He was second team all Pac-12. When you look at him, he is a very good athlete. You can see the frameworks of a guy that's kind of a developmental player, but could develop into a legitimate starter down the road. Uh, what we know was the negatives is he has some off the field issues. Matt Miller, uh, who does a lot of like the Bleacher Report uh, draft rankings, stuff like that, uh, has reported that a lot of people are kind of put off by his off the field issues. And because he is kind of a project player, he's going to simply go a little bit later in the draft. I would probably put him as a early day three, late day two, maybe if he tests well at the combine type prospect. Going to number nine, it's going to be Max Sharping, six foot six, 320 pound tackle from Northern Illinois. In 2018, he was first team all Mac. When you look at Max Sharping, he just strikes off as he has consistency. He's played you know a whole lot of high level football at Northern Illinois. Obviously, low level competition kind of goes in the negative. And he also has ideal size for tackle, but a lot of people think because of his athletic limitations, he might better project as a guard. So, yeah, it goes in the negatives. Uh, level of competition, limited athlete. So, um, you know, again, another guy I think you could look at early day three, late day two uh, in that range, depending on how well he tests at the combine. Going to tackle number eight, we have Andre Dilliard, six foot five, 305 pounds from Washington State in 2018. He was first team all Pac 12. Who the positives, pass protection. He is very good upside, and a lot of people project him to be an all and out starting left tackle at some point in his career. But because he comes from Washington State, there's always going to be questions about his run blocking, and there already is some power concerns about strength. So he could be a guy that could definitely help out his draft stock at the scouting combine. At the senior bowl, he was all right. Didn't wow me, didn't blow you away like some of the other tackles we will talk about. Maybe slightly disappointing because a lot of people had him as a first round prospect for me i think he's gonna go more so in the third round going to tackle number seven we have david edwards six foot seven 320 pounds out of wisconsin in 2018 he was second team all big 10 when you look at david edwards he is really really good you know athletic traits he's a converted tight end anytime you get a guy that's six seven 320 that can move and get involved in the run game like he does he's a very strong run blocker obviously from wisconsin they run the ball well uh, there's going to be some teams that are going to find him as a very intriguing right tackle prospect. But he definitely, because he is a converted tight end, he still needs to you know, get the technical aspect, the footwork, the hand placement all done. And I think from, I watched two chop-offs because I was trying to see if he would be a good fit for the Eagles. Seems somewhat limited in pass protection. Obviously, that comes down to the technique that's kind of needed uh, to protect the quarterbacks. A little, you know, get the, get the blind side cut down there. So uh, I do view him as a high upside player. I think he could go as early as the second round, late second round, but I feel pretty comfortable right now pegging him in as a third round prospect. Going to tackle number six, we have Jawan Taylor, 6'5", 330 pounds from the University of Florida. In 2018, I don't think he got any stats, which is kind of ridiculous because he was probably the best offensive lineman on our team. He is very high upside. I think a lot of people in the scouting community right now are starting to rant and rave about Jawan Taylor. I think he will show out at the combine and test pretty well for a guy that weighs at least 10 pounds heavier than a lot of the elite prospects. Um, I think he's, his pass protection is very, very good. 
Uh, I think he negatives needs to be more consistent. And what I noticed from watching him is he's a slow starter. Like he'll give up. If he was going to give up a sack, it happened in the first quarter and then he would get stronger as the game goes on. So that's obviously a flaw. I don't know if that comes down to mentality. I don't know if that comes down to conditioning. Uh, you know, it's something that probably can be corrected at some point. I think uh, Jawan Taylor, a lot of people have him right now as a potential first round pick. I could see that if he tests well at the combine, but for me, I kind of have him as a player and a tackle that could potentially play guard. So, I mean, there's flexibility there, but on the downside, there could be people that don't want to draft a high pick for a guy that's not going to be a tackle. Um, but I, I would say second round, maybe third, but I would probably put a second round grade on Jawan Taylor right now. Going to tackle number five, we have Yadni Kajust, 6'5", 315 pounds from West Virginia. In 2018, he was first team all Big 12. He is a very good athlete, strong in pass protection. I do think he has a very high ceiling. The negatives for him is that he needs to add a little bit more power to his game. Uh, you, I don't think he's going to test particularly well in the bench press, and he might not be as pro-ready as some people think as a rookie. I think if you're drafting a tackle in the first round, ideally they will start for you as a rookie. Because Yadni Kajust, I think, is a little bit on that cusp, especially because strength is such... Um, you know, a, a, an attribute, a, 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 something that you can grow, you know, get on that strength and conditioning program in the NFL. That's usually like between year rookie and year two, the strength, the power aspect for these offensive linemen goes up tenfold. And maybe you might, if you if you think like, you know, the, the, the point of attack, the power for Kajust is lacking a little bit, you might want to just say, well, let's ease him into the process and have him go to a team that where he can, you know, get on that strength and conditioning program, get a little bit stronger and learn behind a tackle. So because of that, might not be a first round type player, even though I would not be surprised if he does because his upside is very, very high. Um, but I kind of I have him as a fringe first rounder. Definitely will go in the second round at some point. And my pro comparison for him is Laramie Tunsil. I think a lot of traits from Tunsil when he was coming out of Ole Miss, really good athlete, but might not be ready to start day one. Obviously, hopefully, <laughs> unlike Laramie Tunsil, uh, there's no pictures that get leaked on draft day of Kajust with a goddamn bong gas mask on his face. Going to tackle number four, I have Dalton Reznor, 6'5", 305 pounds, out of Kansas State in 2018. He was first team all Big 12. Uh, what he brings is great versatility. I think he can play everywhere on the line. Uh, definitely more so a guard and tackle. He had a really good senior bowl at tackle. He has great consistency, and while he's not that big, you know, 315, 320 mauler, he has that mentality, that mentality that you want all your offensive linemen to have, that John Runyon mentality, I call it. Uh, but the negatives for him is teams should, could just view him as a guard. And a guard, even though we saw what a guy like Quentin Nelson can bring, there's no Quentin Nelson in this year's draft class. So if you view a top tackle prospect as more of a guard, you're not going to really probably put a first-round grade on him, uh, slip into the second round. For me, I think he's a first-round player because of that versatility. My pro comparison for him is Jake Matthews, who was a very high pick a couple of years ago out of Texas A&M, has really solidified himself as one of the better, more consistent tackles in the league for the Atlanta Falcons. So that's I, I think he's going to be, yeah, I would say late first to definitely second-round pick in Dalton Risner. Going to tackle number three, I have Greg Little, 6'5", 325 pounds, out of Ole Miss in 2018. He was first team all SEC. I think he brings prototypical NFL size and length at offensive tackle. And for a guy that's almost 330 pounds, he is a very good athlete. I think he will raise a couple eyes at the NFL scouting combine. But for me, needs a little bit more consistency. His technical ability has to get a lot better, which it probably will if he goes with a good offensive coordinator. Watching his tape, he struggled versus guys that you know had complete pass rushing moves guys that could swim could rip had a little bit of spin to him with that Dwight Freeney every now and again like the guys that had technical ability as far as a pass rusher would cause him some trouble but it is more so an athlete going up against an athlete which you do see a lot of times in college football Greg Little would body you up my pro comparison from him is Ryan Clady former tackle from Boise State as well as the Denver Broncos I think they'll have very similar combines and they have very similar upsides and Clady was one of the better uh, tackles for you know a good five-year period in the National Football League. Going to tackle number two, I have Cody Ford, six foot four, three hundred thirty pounds, out of Oklahoma in 2018. Was first team All Big 12. He is a big, gigantic mauler. And John Ledyard from the Draft Network, which is you know a really, really good site that I try when I when I when I get my own little scouting report, I like to go and see what they say and have a little bit of comparison. Uh, he said he's outstanding footwork and strength, enough so that I was like looking at this guy. I was like, I haven't watched a whole lot of Cody Ford. I thought he was going to be a guard. And the more and more I watched him, the more and more he's probably my favorite offensive line prospect in this draft class. And even though I just can't put him at one because another player has a little bit more consistency, uh, I, I would absolutely, like I said, for 
For me, as an Eagle fan in my Eagles mock draft video, I think he is the perfect fit for my Philadelphia Eagles, and you'll find out why in my pro comparison. But I think Cody Ford has an incredibly high ceiling. Literally, the only negative about him is, again, teams might not think he has the length that they want at offensive tackle, then could be pigeonholed as a guard, and how many teams are going to want to invest in a guard higher than if you need, really need a tackle. You might pass on Cody Ford and get a guy like Greg Little, for example, if you believe Greg Little's length is going to translate better to tackle in the NFL. But I think Cody Ford, with his... His size, his his footwork, his mentality, I think he's all the makings of a left tackle. My pro comparison from him is Jason Peters. Obviously, Jason Peters was a converted tight end, but they have very similar sizes, and I think their strengths look just eerily similar. And for a team like Philly that could very well be looking at replacing Jason Peters, sign me up for Cody Ford if he is somehow still there at pick 25. I think for him, Cody Ford's absolutely a first-round pick, and I kind of looking at the tape, looking at how teams may see what a Quentin Nelson did for the uh, Colts last year, I think Cody Ford's top 15 pick. And at number one, we have Jonah Williams, six foot five, 300 pounds, out of Alabama in 2018. He was first team All SEC, first team All American. When you look at Jonah Williams, he has great power, no weaknesses whatsoever. I, I couldn't see anything, and he's technically sound. He is as refined of an offensive line prospect we have seen in quite some time. Uh, really, the only negative against him is length concerns. Are people think he's going to have that length to play? left tackle, to play right tackle, or are they going to see him more so as a guard? I kind of feel like either or, he is a <laughs> he's a starter. He's a rookie starter, a plug-and-play guy right away, even if you see him as a guard. My pro comparison to him is Joe Staley, who again, when Joe Staley was coming out of Central Michigan, everyone kind of thought you know he was refined, but maybe didn't have the length to play tackle, and he's had a really good career with the San Francisco 49ers at that tackle spot. So I think Jonah Williams, Cody Ford, they are definitely my Tier 1 tackles right now. And I think that uh, both those guys should go within the first 15, 20 picks. And if they do slip, someone is going to get an absolute steal. So moving from the tackles, we're going to go into the interior. Uh, when we did this video last time, I just did top five guards, top five centers. And I'm actually going to combine them all as an interior because I don't want to do, you know, 20 players from the interior. Because there's not that many guys this year that I think will get drafted. So from my 1.0 rankings for guards... At auto mentions, I had Shane Lemieux from Oregon, who went back to school. Teron Pescod from NC State. And then at number five, we had Rosh Piercebacher. Four, Bo Benchwell. Three, Halt Froholt. Two, Nate Herbrig. And one, Michael Dieter. And then my center rankings 1.0, I had Michael Jordan and Lamont Gayard from Georgia as my honorable mentions. At five, we had Garrett Bradbury. Four, Jake Hansen, who, guess, went back to school for Oregon. Uh, number three was Eric McCoy from Texas A&M. Number two was Elkin Jenkins. And number one was Tyler Bidas from Wisconsin, who also went back to school. So looking at the interior, man, I think this is, I'll tell you right now, this is a good year to need a center. This is a very strong center class. Uh, but without further ado, though, for my interior offensive line rankings, 2.0. Jumping in at number 10, we have Rosh Piercebacher, offensive guard from Alabama, 6'3", 300 pounds. In 2018, he was first team All-American, second team All-SEC. Uh, when you look at him, he is just a really good, strong run blocker. And then only negatives is I think he's pretty much peaked. I think he's as finished of a product as you're going to get. Maybe a guy, I think, more so of a depth player on the offensive line, but could potentially develop into a low-end starter. Uh, because of that, I think Pierce Bacher will go somewhere between the fourth and sixth round. Going to guard number nine, we have Drew Sambia, offensive guard from Oklahoma. He's a Sooner, 6'5", 300 pounds in 2018, was a second-team All-American, first-team All-Big 12. When you look at the positives, he's a very athletic offensive lineman, and he has some experience playing tackle, was a left tackle, I believe, as a freshman. But the negatives is he's slightly undersized and um, you know, makes up for his lack of power, his lack of punch, which I think could kind of be held against him in the National Football League with his athletic ability. So, I mean, he is going to be a scheme-dependent player, I think that if you are much more of a zone blocking team, uh, he has a little bit more value there. But for me, I think Drew Samia, probably early day three, somewhere in that fourth, fifth round. Going to guard number eight, pretty much the inverse of a Drew Samia. We have Terod Prescott, guard from NC State, six foot five, 340 pounds in 2018. He was a first team All American from ESPN, not like AP or anything like that. Uh, but he is unreal power. This guy is outstanding power, and he is a, you know, if you're looking just for a pure, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to protect my quarterback, Prescott is going to be your guy. But at that size, 340, very limited athlete. Not going to be a guard that can pull. Not going to be a great guard at getting to the second level. So he is, kind of like Sam, you know, the inverse, a scheme-dependent player, and I kind of still have him as a early day three prospect, round four, round five, somewhere in that range. Going to guard number seven, we have Bo Benchwell, six foot five, three hundred twenty pounds from Wisconsin. 
2018, he was a first team All American, first team All Big Ten, and pretty much like any player from Wisconsin, he is an absolute mauler in the run game. And where I have him ahead of those other guys is I think he has a little bit more upside. I think he has some some potential there. Uh, and really, there was just from a from a base skill standpoint, when he's on when he's fire, when he's on fire, when he's feeling it. He is a very, very technically sound guard. But as Kyle Crouch from the Draft Network has brought up from watching a lot of his tape, he's inconsistent. Doesn't always bring it on every single game, which is ultimately kind of going to be held against him. I think he has a chance to go day two, but more so I feel comfortable even with the next couple prospects saying that they're going to be early day three prospects that uh, might have somewhat limited ceilings. But I personally think Ben Swale, if he can get that consistency, if he can just get that final little bit of technical refinement, uh, he could be a nice starting guard in the NFL for quite some time. Going to uh, guard number six, we have Connor McGovern. Six foot five, 315 pounds out of Penn State. In 2018, was a third team all Big Ten. We look at Connor McGovern, the positives are his versatility. He played guard, he can play center, which is always you know a big plus for interior offensive linemen when you don't have to dress as many guys because you have some of these depth players as rookies that can kind of get two birds stoned at once. And I think he has really good upside. He's got better every single year at Penn State and obviously was a big reason for the success of Saquon Barkley a couple years ago. But the negatives, he needs to get stronger. You know, you look at his body type 6'5", 315, you'd say, okay, well, you know, 315, you're a big boy. Uh, you just don't see him play with that play strength uh, that, you know, but... Anytime you have play strength as an issue, I like the gamble that they will get it all together once they get to the National Football League on a proper strength and conditioning schedule. So for that, I still have Connor McGovern as a early day three prospect, round four to round five. Going to number five, our first center, we have Eric McCoy, six foot four, 315 pounds out of Texas A&M. Didn't actually get any awards, got stubbed for uh, 2018 stats. But when I look at him, I see good power. I see a guy that's really, really balanced and refined in run and pass protection. And he brings versatility, being able to play guard and center. The negatives could be viewed as somewhat limited ceiling, might be coming out as almost a complete prospect. And uh, because he might be viewed as a finished product, that's kind of why I have him slipping down opposed to some of the other centers in the class. My pro comparison of him is Pat Elfline, who pretty much had the same kind of things talked about him when he was coming out of Ohio State, brought some versatility, but might have been as ready and as high as he was going to develop in his professional playing cycle. But I still think a guy like Eric McCoy brings, you know, the fact that he can probably start as a rookie has some added value. And for me, I have Eric McCoy going somewhere between round three and round four. Going to interior offensive lineman number four, we have Elton Jenkins, center, six foot four, 315 pounds from Mississippi State in 2018, was first team All American. When you look at Jenkins here, he is good in run and pass protection. Great mobility between the trenches for his size. And a lot of scouts and a lot of scouting reports that I've been reading, uh, John Ledyard from the Draft Network, rave about his high football IQ. He brings great versatility. He's played tackle, guard, and center. So that is going to be a value within itself. Uh, the negatives, again, from John Ledyard from the Draft Network, is he's not nasty enough. Gets shook in games. I didn't necessarily see this, but I figured because it came up in a couple scouting reports, uh, it must be something worth noting, even though I technically have only watched two cut-ups. Uh, for, I, I pretty much just watch anytime Mississippi State plays a legitimate opponent. Kind of, he looked fine for me. But anyways, uh, my pro comparison for him is Joe Tooney of the New England Patriots. I think another guy that brings good versatility and goes to the right scheme. Get a right offensive line coach about, about him, and you're going to get the highest potential from Elton Jenkins. I think he has a chance to go in the second round, but uh, definitely second, third round prospect for me. Going two into your offensive lineman, number three, I have Michael Dieter, offensive guard, you just generally call him an offensive lineman, from Wisconsin, 6'6", 320, in 2018, was first team All-Big Ten, first team All-American, I think you see a great athlete, and incredible versatility, can play everywhere on the offensive line, uh, the only negatives is from, I got this from Kyle Krabs from the Draft Network, because I didn't really see it, but was a lack of length, shows up on tape, for a guy that's 6'6", six, six, might not necessarily have the longest limbs, which affects you know your punch and your initial push, but I think a guy like Michael Dieter has a very high ceiling and the fact that he brings as good versatility as I think anyone in this year's draft class, probably without him and Dalton Risner, um, that's going to be tremendous value. I think Dieter is a lock to go in the second round. And my pro comparison for him is Kyle Long, the guard from the Chicago Bears, who, like Dieter, is a very athletic player that has that versatility to play guard and tackle. 
Going interior offensive lineman number two, I have Chris Lindstrom, offensive guard from Boston College, six foot four, three hundred and five pounds. In twenty eighteen, was first team All ACC. Looking at the positives here, he has great bursts off the line of scrimmage and an excellent run blocker. Brings that mauler mentality that a lot of people nowadays, because we all saw and got the hype around a Quentin Nelson, that's kind of what you want your offensive lineman to be. And while he's not huge, and there's going to be questions about his pass protection at the NFL level, because obviously Boston College likes to run the ball, and when you're you know around that 300-yard mark, people are always going to bring your strength concerns uh, up. You know, it's somewhat valid, but I, I just think he's good enough, he's athletic enough, doesn't have any glaring weaknesses. Uh, that he could be a very valuable player as a rookie. My pro comparison for him is Trey Turner, who is a very talented and versatile and athletic guard for the Carolina Panthers, probably the most consistent offensive lineman that they have. I think Chris Lindstrom has a chance to sneak into the first round, but for me, I kind of have him as a second-round prospect. And then finishing up the interior of the offensive line, I have Garrett Bradbury, center from NC State, 6'3", 300 pounds. In 2018, he was first-team All-ACC. 2018 Remington winner, which goes to the best center in college. He is a convert at tight end he is an exceptionally good athlete great at getting the second level pretty much a lead blocker highest ceiling i think for any player for the interior offensive line and the only negatives is because he's a converted tight end doesn't have the play strength that a lot of these other guys that have been a, you know obviously an offensive lineman from high school quite have but i think that's going to be an absolute no-brainer and it's going to be able to get fixed good enough so that he goes in the nfl but that's never going to be the kind of player he's going to be he's going to be a scheme dependent player but a very very good scheme dependent player my pro comparison for him is very easily jason kelsey while he's slightly bigger you just see uh, for Garrett Bradbury's tape, you know, that, that ability, that willingness to want to get to the second level, to lay the pancake block and free up holes for your running backs. Uh, I think he's in, you know, I think Garrett Bradbury should go in the first round. There's a chance that, you know, maybe Elton Jenkins gets drafted a little bit higher um, because of that versatility. But I think if you want a center and if you have a scheme that's going to benefit having an athletic mobile center, Garrett Bradbury has that ceiling to be a future all pro in this league. I think I'm, you know, I'm incredibly high on him and watching his NC State. I, I, I didn't even really like, obviously, you know, if you look at pro football focus or something like that, he has been maybe one of their darlings this year, but I was just watching when I was looking at Ryan Finley's tape and anytime they ran the ball, I was like, my God, look at that center. Like it looks like Jason Kelsey out there, but obviously Jason Kelsey wasn't nearly as highly regarded when he was coming to Cincinnati. So, um, but that, that's my pro cup for him. And I think for me, he is my best interior offensive lineman. So I know there's probably not a lot of you guys are going to agree or disagree or have some big hot debates about offensive line. But if you do, if there's maybe someone that I missed from my list, let me know in the comment section below and I can do further read-ups on them. But I think this is as conclusive and as established of a list as I'm going to get. Slight things could change. I mean, everyone remembers what Orlando Brown did at the combine last year. He came in as like a top three tackle. Had one of the worst combines ever and still, you know, had a you know pretty big slip in the draft. So, I mean, that could technically happen. Uh, but a lot of my top tier prospects, especially the top five guys that I gave pro comps, I feel pretty comfortable where they are ranked. But thank you guys for watching the offensive alignment. I know it's not the prettiest video to talk about. But it had to get done, and hopefully some of you guys out there that NFL teams need interior offensive linemen or tackles uh, got something out of this video. We'll be back next time with defense alignment, so it's a little bit more sexy because it is the strength of the draft. But thank you guys for watching, and as always, if it's your first time stopping by, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button. There's going to be plenty more draft content along the ways. Smash the like button if you enjoyed, and until next time, it's C4 saying peace out.